Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 67. No matter how old you get, if you can keep the desire to be creative, you're keeping the man-child alive. John Cassavetes. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Don't forget to head over to filmfestivaltips.com. That's filmfestivaltips.com to download my six secrets to getting into film festivals for cheap or free. And today's show is sponsored by Film Festival Hacks, How to Submit Like a Pro, the only course in the world that teaches you all the ins and outs of film festivals, how to submit, how not to be taken advantage of, and so on. Just head over to filmfestivalhacks.com for that. And if you stay tuned to the end of the episode, I give away a link to getting 50% off Film Festival Hacks for a limited time only, so stay tuned. Now, you can see there's a theme going on so far in this episode uh, about film festivals. We have the leading authority on film festivals, the man who literally wrote the book on it. His name is Chris Holland. Uh, We've talked about him before. Um, He's my co-instructor on the Film Festival Hacks course. He runs an amazing website called filmfestivalsecrets.com. Chris has been in the film festival game for over a decade now, and he created Film Festival Secrets to kind of help help other filmmakers and understand the process because it's a, it was kind of like a mystery. And he had seen all the behind the scenes stuff of how film festivals work. And he's worked at some major film festivals around the country and really has an insight that was uh, rare and decided to write the book, literally the book on it called Film Festival Secrets. And later he opened up filmfestivalsecrets.com to help uh, and consult filmmakers on their films, how to submit to properly to film festivals, what pro- festivals to submit to, and so on. So I wanted to bring him on the show and really kind of break down and get some inside information on what it really takes to get into film festivals and how to use film festivals for what they're what they're worth and what they can do for you and leverage them and not to be taken advantage by the process and not to throw money away. Because I mean, I've been in over 600 film festivals with all my projects over the years. And believe me, I've lost thousands of dollars in submission processes and traveling to festivals and things like that. And, you know, Chris really talks a lot about what to do, how to be strategic with your money, how to be strategic with your time and make it work for you guys. So without further ado, here is my interview with Chris Holland. May I introduce to our indie film hustlers, the man, the myth, the legend, Chris Holland. Thank you, sir. You say that to all the boys, don't you? I say that to everyone, sir. But 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 with you, I say it's special. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> I, I feel duly special how are you man i'm doing great but i'm it's doing nice great to talk to you i've been trying to get chris on the show for oh god months now we've been we've been friends for a while and we're like i gotta get you on the show gotta get you on the show gotta get you on the show we just never we never get around to it though we talk all the time we just never got around to it so we finally set a time and uh, i wanted to share all of chris's amazing film festival knowledge with the with the tribe so my first question chris is how did you get into the film festival game? Uh, well, back in the dark days of the early internet, uh, let's say 96, 97. Oof, rough times, uh, rough, rough, know, rough times, rough times, rough times. I was a film critic. Um, one of the very first what would later become uh, bloggers. Uh, I want to tell you how special this was, Alex. Mm-hmm. It was so special that in, I think it was 99, uh, my co-writer and I actually got written up in the New York Times <laughs> for reviewing Godzilla movies on the internet. I kid you not. You got to be kidding. So there literally was nobody doing this. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a brand new thing. Guys who review weird movies on the internet, that is worthy of a New York Times article. It's framed on my office wall. I That's tell, so anyway. brilliant. Yeah. Anyway, but – uh, as time went on, you know, we thought, man, we're going to make some money on this internet film criticism stuff. No. So <laughs> when it became apparent that everybody and his dog was going to be reviewing movies on the internet, uh, you know, I, I looked around for something else and that's something else, uh, eventually became film festivals. Not that there's a ton of money in film festivals, but I eventually fell in with a distributor that was doing, very interesting things uh, that included film festivals in a big way. 
So I got to know two or 300 different film festival directors and, you know, the rest is history. Uh, I've worked for, I've worked on staff at four film festivals now, uh, Mm -hmm. Austin, Atlanta, Oxford, and Portland. Um, And, you know, it's been a great ride. Nice. Nice. So, um... Are let me ask you, are are festivals even relevant nowadays? Like for, for for filmmakers to submit? Because I mean, in the world that we are today, like I know before it was the only way to kind of get noticed, but now with all the stuff that happens online, is it even relevant? Oh, well, I think you know this is a question that gets asked about once a year at somebody's conference or or whatever, or, or in a blog. Are festivals still a thing? Yeah, of course they are. Okay, of course film festivals are still a thing. Uh, Sundance just made its largest ever. You know, not that they sold the film, but the the film sold during the festival. Seventeen point uh, five million. Yeah. So just because new doors open in the world of indie film doesn't mean that the old ones disappear. Mm-hmm. Um, if anything, festivals are more relevant because they're the only ones who are willing to go through the thousands of movies that get made every year to find the good stuff. And let me tell you, there's more and more of these films being made every year. Um, submission rates go up and up and up. Every film festival everywhere touts its you know record breaking number of submissions every year. It's not like they're doing anything to earn that. The, the films right. are coming to them, right? So uh, next time you hear a festival go, we had a record breaking five thousand films this year. You know, recognize that's a big number, but it just is the rising tide lifting all the boats. Somebody's got to go through all those films. Somebody's got to figure out what what the good is and what the bad is, and I don't see the distributors looking to do that. You know, that's a labor of love, and the festivals are the ones who who have that love. Are there is there any money to be made at film festivals? Like, I know obviously Sundance in Toronto and the Big Boys, but like you know, Moose Jaw Film Festival somewhere in the middle of the country is is it? Are they making money? Like, how what's the what's the financial scenario with with money with festivals? Uh, if you're talking about the festivals themselves, yeah. There are many festivals that are run as nonprofits. Most of them are run as nonprofits. Okay. That doesn't mean that there is no profit involved. But very often the kind of people that you get who start a film festival, you know, to them nonprofit means so long as they break even, they're okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's, you know, a lot of festivals are on the edge. A lot of them shut down in 2008, 9, 10, you know, when sponsorship money dried up. Uh, right. There are festivals that do very well that are run smartly, um, and South by Southwest is a for-profit endeavor. It's so a monster. It's yeah. a monster. There's money to be made, but you have to look at it as a business. Uh, when it comes to is there money for filmmakers at festivals, um, pro- you know, generally not. Generally, <laughs> it is a a, a way. To get other benefits, which we can talk about uh, later on, but mm-hmm. um, you know, with a few exceptions, you know, either niche content or films that are so you know upper level that they already have distribution, there's no money changing hands between festivals and filmmakers generally. But there are prizes and things like that sometimes. Sure, but I wouldn't. That's that's not a business model. Mm-hmm. Right. That's, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. That's not a business model for a filmmaker. Like I'm going to make them submit and it's $10,000 at first price. So obviously I'm going to get that. Right. <laughs> that's more of a lottery ticket mentality. Mm-hmm. So, so you just got back from South by Southwest. I've never been to the South by Southwest film festival. I've been to many other ones, but I've never been to that one. Can you tell the audience a little bit of what you saw there this year and, how things have changed since last time you were there and any, any good gossip, <laughs> any good gossip. Well, number, number one, Austin is changing. Okay. Uh, you know, for those who may have been there in the past, but haven't been in a few years, Austin itself is almost unrecognizable. And I think that is a direct, uh, you know, impact that South by Southwest has South by Southwest, you know, brought all of these, creative and technically inclined people to Austin who figured out how cool it was, started moving there, started starting companies there, which brought the bigger tech companies who Facebook, Google, you know, they brought their offices to Austin. And so now uh, there's all of this technology industry, you know, building up there and they need offices, they need housing. But in a more direct way, there are more hotels and conference spaces and theaters in Austin than ever before. 
Mm. So they are quite literally changing the face of what Austin looks like. From a festival perspective, uh, we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. You know, it's much the same as it was with the exception of sort of this sprawl of um, venues. They've opened satellite venues. They've uh, colonized some live theater spaces. Um, so it's actually a lot harder to get. Well, I won't say a lot harder. It's harder to get a diverse sampling of things that you want to see because like films tend to get programmed at like venues. So um, tentpole features are going to play at the Paramount or a larger venue like that. Mm -hmm. And smaller indie films are going to play at at smaller venues like the Alamo Ritz. And then shorts, for some reason, all got, you know, sort of um, in the bathroom. Well, not so much in the bathroom. (laughs) They had decent sized spaces because there are lots of filmmakers who show up for those. Right. They're all traveling in from out of town and Mm -hmm. those who are local are bringing like so they need space, but they're not getting the the cherry downtown spaces that they could be. Um, and that's, it, they're not being exiled or anything, but they are, you know, it's get on a shuttle kind of thing. And so if you're going to do that, um, you, you want to spend as little time as possible sitting on a bus traveling between, you want to be doing stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're going to see short films, it makes a lot more sense to just spend a day at the venue where the shorts are being played and watch a bunch of them. Got it. So the, the changes to South by Southwest that I see are logistical. Uh, and maybe that's just like my brain, like that's what I'm looking for. But um, artistically, I think they are as adventurous as they ever were. They're getting better and bigger sort of premiere type things. Like they had Pee Wee's Big Holiday and, mm-hmm. you know, all, the, all um, they had that midnight Keanu screening. So there's more demand and more stuff that they're trying to stuff into the same amount of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but – it's still got that South by Southwest flavor. So it seems like South, and again, I, and this might be a horrible analogy, but it seems like it's it's a Sundance meets Comic Con because it's so big in scope. No, obviously not comic book stuff, but studios are starting to come in there, and there and there's and it's not just a film festival; it's a music festival, and it's also a technology festival. Correct? Right. So the three different uh, sections of South by Southwest are music, which was its primary purpose from the beginning. Uh, film and interactive, Mm -hmm. uh, film and interactive begin on the Friday of the first weekend and, uh, film continues basically through the, the following week. I don't think it plays into the next weekend, but I could be wrong about that. Um, and then, uh, interactive is only four or five days long. That takes place over that first weekend into like the, that Tuesday. And then music starts up on Wednesday of, of the middle of that week and plays through the following weekend. So it's actually these three things all taking place at once. Some of the film and interactive things overlap in terms of programming. Like there are panels that you can go to if you have a film badge. There are films you can go to if you have an interactive badge. And then um, you know music and film also overlap in certain places. So there's a lot to get out of it. Sounds there's- exhausting. It is exhausting. <laughs> I was only there for five days and uh, basically needed another week to get over it. You know? It's like Sundance. It's exactly like Sundance when you yes, do Sundance. but without the 12 pounds of additional clothing that you need to wear. <laughs> um, yes, and the and you can't breathe because you're up 5,000 feet yeah. or 10,000 feet or however high you are. Uh, uh, but it, it has its own challenges for sure. What is your favorite film festival that you've been at? Like that you absolutely just love the vibe and love the whole thing? As an attendee, uh, the first five years of Fantastic Fest Mm -hmm. were my favorite film festival experience ever. Um, I have not been since then. I think it's probably been five or six years since I've been to a Fantastic Fest. And that just is because of badge scarcity. They, um, and the fact that I don't live in Austin, you Mm -hmm. know, um, but, uh, when I was living in Austin, it was hands down, like, it's one of the few festivals where I went every time there was a film playing, I was in a theater um, because the films themselves were so exciting and I wasn't going to chance to see them anywhere else. And man, what a great, just like film purist environment mm-hmm. uh, as an industry member. Uh, I mean, South by is right up there. Mm-hmm. I, um, 
man, there's so many good ones. I, I had a really good time in, in Toronto. Uh, I think Hot Docs, if you're a documentary filmmaker, there are a few, few places that are better to be than Hot Docs. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know what? Sidewalk. Birmingham, Alabama. I'm oh, I heard about Sidewalk. Yeah, I heard about Shout that Shout out one. to Sidewalk. Okay. Very um, cool. You've, you've heard me ramble on about the Oxford Film Festival before. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, there, there are some festivals in the Deep South, which is where I'm living now, Atlanta, um, that are just, you know, top notch in terms of like small town audience feel. They take care of the filmmakers, uh, you know, Oxford and Indie Memphis and Sidewalk. Like these are great festivals. Awesome. Awesome. Now, what are some of the benefits of screening at a film festival nowadays? Uh, I would say the three primary um, benefits these days are the credibility that you get from, you know, a festival putting its stamp of approval on your film. Um, the opportunity to build an audience and and, thereby get some distribution and, uh, the ability to sort of meet your peers and, um, have a career day, meet other people in the industry and, and make those connections that will serve you through your future projects. It's very true. I've met so many different people at these at film festivals. It's it's not even funny, and it's like at Sundance in Toronto and things like that. Uh, and I think that sometimes the smaller festivals, depending on where you are, if you if you're if it's in your town, then it's very beneficial for you to network. But those bigger festivals, you meet people that you might never have access to, especially like a Sundance. When I was living in Florida, I'd go to Sundance, and you have L.A. there. L.A. is in a three block radius. Uh, everybody walking the streets is in the business. So uh, the access you get is pretty remarkable. Would you yeah, agree? That's true. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's just no question. Now, uh, do you have any advice uh, on how to choose the right film festival for, for a, a filmmaker's film? Uh, well, there's a lot of legwork involved for mm-hmm. sure. Okay. Um, I, I think you can uh, get a real head start by doing two things. Uh, number one, go grab the list of, um, Oscar accredited film festivals, uh, print it out and tear it up, uh, because <laughs> those festivals, you know, that list of festivals is so over relied upon by filmmakers that those festivals, you know, even though the Oscar accreditation is only for shorts, feature filmmakers use that list too. And so those, those festivals are just overwhelmed with submissions. You are instantly putting yourself at a disadvantage by submitting to an Oscar accredited film festival. Mm -hmm. Uh, Anybody who works at an Oscar accredited film festival, like I did twice, both Austin and Atlanta, uh, who feels offended that that really shouldn't because you're getting so much more than your share of the, (laughs) of the independent films that are made every year. Right. Um, You know, let's give some of the other festivals that are just as good have just as many people coming to them who treat their filmmakers just as well, you know, let's give those a chance. Well, let me ask you a question. When you say Oscar accreditation, that's not for features. That's for f- shorts, right? That's correct. Yeah. There's no such thing as Oscar accreditation for features. Because I've never seen yeah. I've never seen the winner of the Austin Film Festival up for Best Picture at the Oscars. No. I mean, you've seen films that shorts. have played. Oh, of course. Um, of course. Like Slumdog Millionaire yeah. played. Uh, Little Miss Sunshine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All those kind of films. Got it. Um, now, how do you leverage film festival screenings to help you get fil- your film distributed? Uh, there are a couple of different things you can do um, depending on who you are and what you've got. I mean, number one, if you're playing at a major film festivals, a, a festival and you're a feature, distributors are going to come to you. So that's, I mean, number one sort of mission accomplished right off the bat. Mm -hmm. You're putting your film in front of distributors. But if you're at a smaller festival or at a festival where the distributors don't seem to be coming out of the woodwork to find you, uh, I would use that opportunity to um, start building your audience and start uh, collecting the names and email addresses of the people who are your fans, who love your film. Uh, there was a film called, it was by the Yes Men. Yes. And it was a South by Southwest. Um, what was the name of that film? Um, the one that was called the Yes Men, which was a documentary. Um, It was called something like everybody hates the Yes Men. Yeah. That was a sequel. Yeah. I only saw the the original one, but yeah, yeah, there was a sequel to it. Right. So, you know, the, the, these guys, uh, it's a couple of performance artists basically with a team of people around them. Uh, they played the sequel at South by Southwest and, 
This was, I want to say, six, seven years ago. Literally had clipboards with sign-up sheets. And in this 1,400-seat movie palace, they passed around clipboards and pens and got people to, you know, sign up. Now, that's an activist film where people are, you know, naturally inclined to want to be a part of what they're Mm -hmm, doing. mm -hmm. But that's something you can do at any festival, you know? We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. It's it's extremely difficult as a filmmaker with no existing audience to collect 300 signatures or 300 uh, email addresses in one go on the internet. But at a film festival, while those people are sitting, you know, in the audience and have just seen your film and are in love with you, it's really easy. Mm-hmm. So um, that's the kind of thing that distributors are looking for when you approach them. And you say, I know the names and email addresses of, you know, 2,000 people that I've collected over the last year of being on the film festival circuit who are interested in this movie and will tell their friends. If you can say that to a distributor, you are head and shoulders above pretty much anybody else, uh, you know, approaching distributors because they don't think ahead to do that kind of thing. Yeah, distributors, I mean, they want as easy of a ride to make their money as possible. And if you can provide them with, you know, a three or 4,000 person list of people for your film, uh, you're going to get a a distribution deal so much faster. That's why a lot of these YouTube stars are creating their own projects and not even going to distributors, distributing themselves. Um, Okay. That brings me to a question. Can you talk a little bit about like, you know, if if your internet, if your movies on Vimeo or on YouTube and you know, it gets disqualified from film festivals. I know that was a big thing when the internet first came out. Is that still a thing? And how does that work? It's definitely still a thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, By and large, and it's boy, howdy, is it still a thing with Oscar accreditation? Mm -hmm. Uh, So if you have any thoughts at all, you know, as to the future distribution or no festival play of your film, do not make your film available publicly on YouTube or Vimeo or any of that stuff until you've done those things. Um, You know, a lot of people will tell you it doesn't matter and festivals are taking these things all the time. And it's true. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of festivals out there that are taking films that are available online. And that's totally cool of those festivals. But there's a lot of festivals that still aren't. Uh, And if you, you know, unless you want to instantly cut your, um, possible selection of film festivals in half, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just hold off on putting it online and, and keep control of your assets because you don't want your editor or whatever, um, to mistakenly think that that's an okay thing to do. I have a crazy story of, of, of one Sundance filmmaker who got into Sundance, had a feature film and he was in, he was in competition and I think a producer of his, Oh no! Put it on. It was on Vimeo with password, but he either accidentally or on purpose oh, no. <laughs> pulled off the password for a day or two, and Sundance caught wind of it. How I don't know, but they disqualified him and kicked him out. And I'm sure that that boy is still somewhere in a mental institution. Probably. I mean, can you yeah. imagine? Can you it, imagine? Oh, I, I, I would love to know like the real details behind that because, you know, for a day or two, that seems like something Sundance might forgive. But yeah. without knowing the specifics, you just of course. Shake, shake your head and go, that sucks, dude. <laughs> <laughs> that does suck. So well, let me ask you, what are some of the, the craziest stories you've – you've been to a lot of film festivals. What's some of the craziest stories you've ever heard? Craziest stories I've ever heard. Well, I mean, some of the craziest stories I've ever seen, uh, you know, the filmmakers will do all kinds of things to promote their film. Sometimes at my urging, uh, <laughs> a friend of mine had a film called the Stanton family grave robbery. That sounds fantastic. A guy named Mark Potts. And, uh, I'll tell the story, but I want to go back to that title. In just a yeah, second. the title's awesome, actually. Um, so <laughs> As part of the uh, sort of promotion for his film, he and his like three or four uh, cohorts who were at the uh, – this was at the Austin Film Festival. Mm -hmm. They bought a coffin okay, and carried it around with them and the coffin had like flyers taped to the side of it. Absolutely. When the screenings were – and you know, it was – Where was this? And what what festival? the Austin Film Festival. Oh, Jesus. And I know they did it a couple of – basically anywhere they could drive to – and shove this coffin in the back of the station wagon, 
they would take the stuff <laughs> off of us. It was <laughs> ridiculous. Right. I was going to ask you, where are they? How are they driving this around? Did they rent a hearse? <laughs> no, they, they just had a station wagon. Okay. Or a hatchback or something. It was, you know, full size coffin too. I'm sure. And, and, been thinking they might have bought a like a child size, but okay, you know, that's just uh, it, morbid. Yeah, I was about to say that's just that's just wrong. <laughs> and it worked. Did more it work? Convenient. And uh, it, yeah, I mean, that definitely got attention. I still have photos of uh, you know that surface every once in a while of these guys with their stinking coffin. Um, and I wanted to go back to the title because titling of a film is something that. Uh, I think filmmakers overlook as an opportunity to stand out. Yep. Um, so many people will name their films, you know, very generic phrases that sort of seem profound in the moment, but actually make your film very difficult to remember, much less find on the internet. Like, so like the tree. Right. Or, <laughs> I don't or, even know um, if that's a, if that's a movie or not, but the, ch- right. well, the, ch- the chair worked. No, that no, wasn't even the chair. What was that movie? The fuzzy chair, the, Oh, the oh yeah, the comfy chair. Comfy the, chair, like, but that puffy chair, puffy, puffy, chair. but you see, puffy chair is a better title than just the chair, right? <laughs> but yeah, these very generic phrases that you know, that's something that Hollywood does because they are going to carpet bomb mm-hmm. the world with advertising, and you know the shorter something is, the better in that scenario. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But in the scenario where you have to be different because you don't have the ability to carpet bomb whatever it is then you really want to go with something memorable and i suggest stringing together two or three words that aren't ordinarily paired with one another so you know um coffee with milk is not a good example because everybody uses that phrase right unless brad pitts the star and then you're okay (laughs) but the stanton family grave robbery which has you know a a proper name, a proper noun, right? Yep, and yep. Uh, what the heck is a family grave robbery? I got to see that. That gets attention. Absolutely. And nobody else is using that phrase anywhere on the internet. Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. Um, instantly be able to uh, find that on, on the internet once, once you've got the name. Yeah, I'm actually consulting on a feature film right now. Um, and they came to me. They're like, you know, we can't get into festivals and – you know, what's going on? What can you help us with? And I looked at the movie. I was like, well, first thing, you've got to change that title. Uh, it was just such a generic title mm-hmm. that created no excitement whatsoever. And I'm like, you've got to change that title. And they're like, oh, well, we've done this, this, this on it already. I'm like, well, if you want to sell it, you got to change the title. If not, you'll never sell it. So we're working yeah. on new titles for it as well. And I worked on um, a film, uh, um, a Sundance winner called Obsolidia. Which was a great title because it's mm-hmm. like, what is Obsolidia? And and the second anyone typed that word in, they're the number one ranking. And they actually said that like it was the greatest move we ever did because we controlled Google <laughs> for that title. So exactly, titles are very, very, very important. Um, any any crazy like after hours stories? Because I have a few of those after hours at a film festival. After well, I mean, you want to go to a a festival that's got crazy after hour stuff going on, uh, go to some festivals in Texas, but like small town, Texas, <laughs> um, the Marfa film festival. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, this is a few years back, but Marfa's in a town or Marfa is a town in far West Texas to get okay. there. You basically have to fly into Austin and then drive six hours. <laughs> Do oh West. God. Yeah. Texas is big, man. It's it is a big really, place. It's a big it's, place. It's a big place. <laughs> Uh, but once you get there, the first thing you notice is that there's no traffic noise. There's just no city noise of any kind. So it's eerily silent, Mm -hmm. which of course, when you're out in the middle of nowhere with nobody to tell you not to do crazy shit, that's, you know, exactly when crazy, well, crazy stuff goes on. Right. Right. Um, especially when you have a bunch of filmmakers and, you know, festival people from, um, other festivals in Texas who, you know, have done their events for the year and just kind of want to let go a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it provides a lot of opportunity for um, letting your hair down, shall we say. And Marfa's, a, you know, an artist commune. There's a lot of people who have been there for many, many years who have been smoking many, many joints. And <laughs> uh, there, there's a lot of – there's more opportunity than when you would think to get into trouble – in a town like that. Uh, I just love Marfa 
anyway. Like their, their theater is this wonderful little um, sort of converted – it's a converted feed store. <laughs> you can't write this stuff. I mean yeah, seriously. And, and I, have a, um, I have a picture. Maybe I'll, I'll send it to you so you can include it in the show notes. But it's just this beautiful little wooden seat converted feed store. But the edge of the feed store is literally 20 feet from the train tracks. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So you'll be sitting there watching a a movie and then for about five minutes every hour or so, you'll hear the train just whiz by, you know, it's like not the greatest environment for like, not, not a, you know, controlled theater environment, but it sort of gives it that character, that bit of authenticity that makes it um, a very memorable festival to visit. So can I tell you? Can I tell you one of my crazy Sundance stories? You obviously want to. So I have to. I, I have to. I, ha- I'm, I am the host of the show. <laughs> I have to tell you. No, I think you'll get a kick out of it. So back in the back in the day, I, I don't know if you remember. I'm sure you've been to Sundance a bunch of times. They used to have a lot of big big house parties up in the hills. Like my, these, these big, they rent out the mansions and they would just have these crazy house parties. And I don't know if they do it as much now because I think the residents started complaining. So I'm not sure if they do it as much anymore. But when I was there, um, w- me and my buddy were just like, okay, let's let's see if we can crash this party. All we would do is crash parties left and right at Sundance. And this one party was up in the middle of the hill, just a monstrous, I mean, ridiculous mansion, wooden mansion, you know, like a log cabin there. And, you know, there's, there's security. There's, you know, a, a, there's a line to get into the list to see if you can get in. And I earlier that day had spoken to an agent from CAA. And when I got up to the front, I was like, who are you? I'm like, oh, I'm so-and-so from CAA. And they're like, well, go right on in, sir. (laughs) So I walked right on in. uh, And all of us, and then my buddy, who's like, I'm just going to try to sneak around the back. But I was smart enough to go, well, let me me just do this. So he jumped like five fences, broke through a window. (laughs) Like I mean, he's like all the way in to get in and find and like someone was smoking a joint in the back or having sex in the back or something. He's like, excuse me, he just walked right by. And then we're inside and there's celebrities everywhere. I mean, all the movie stars of the day were there. And we're, you know, I'm from, I was in, from Florida. It was like my first Sundance. I was so excited. Uh, and then five minutes later, the cops came because someone pulled a fire alarm. <laughs> I was like, son of a bitch. But that was uh, a... Yeah. And then we couldn't, and then we couldn't, and then we couldn't uh, get a, a a ride back. So we actually jumped into a limo with some celebrities, and they drove us back into town. It's a fun festival, man. That's a rough life you lead there, sir. Well, I wish it was like that every day, sir, but it's not. It's, it's not. It's not, sir. No. At the at the indie film hustle, there's a term we call hustling, and uh, we hustle to get into the party and hustle to get down to the the town. But that doesn't happen every day. Not every day. Um, all right, so back to back to back to uh, back to business. Um, what are some of the reasons why films get rejected from film festivals? Because I know a lot of filmmakers are so pained when they're rejected, myself included. Uh, so, what are some of the main reasons that they reject them? Well, I mean, there's the one reason that nobody wants to hear, and that that is your film just doesn't stack up against other films. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are lots and lots of really good films that don't get into festivals because it's not enough to be really good anymore. You have to be great. Um, and that's not to say that if you have a really good film, it won't go anywhere, but, uh, you definitely need to pick your, you know, pick your battles. You're not going to get into Tribeca or Sundance or whatever with a really good film. Uh, some really good films do, but the, the numbers are just stacked against you. So incredibly, uh, other reasons, I mean, there are more reasons not to get selected that have nothing to do with the quality of your film, mm-hmm. um, than, than simply the quality of your film. Like I was, I'm put in mind of something that Dan Brawley from the Kukuloris film festival said at South by Southwest during a meeting of festival programmers, there are a couple of filmmakers in the room and they're like, you know, um, I'm just confused as to why my film didn't get into festivals. Mm -hmm. And Dan said, you know, for you to get offended that you didn't get into my film festival would be akin to you walking into the grocery store, 
buying the things you need, walking out and then saying everything that I didn't buy in the grocery store is garbage, right? Because that wasn't <laughs> the stuff I selected. It's all garbage. They, you know, you just you can't buy everything. You can't eat everything. That's a great so, analogy, right? So <clears throat> you just have to leave some things behind because there's only so much room in your shopping cart. I guess is the um, and and what that shopping cart looks like is different for every festival. Mm -hmm. um, every festival has an audience to satisfy. And, you know, I think this goes back to, to sort of standard film festival economics, film festivals serve an audience. That audience is not filmmakers. That audience is the people who live in their town or who come to their town to see the movies. Those people, although they buy tickets or passes or whatever, those people are not really the customer either. They're the audience, but they're not the customer. The customer is the sponsors, the sponsors and the people who pay grants. Um, those are the actual customers because the bulk of the money comes from them. And what do they want? They want a full house. They want to see an event that has, you know, every single seat filled for every single thing. And the better you can do that, the better you can serve that audience, the more likely you are to get more money from the sponsors. Okay. So knowing this, you have to pick your films with that in mind. You have to know, what the festival reacted well to in the previous years and what they didn't so that you don't make the same mistakes over and over again. You can have the best film about, you know, gay cowboys in love, but if your audience hates gay cowboys in love, you are you know, not going to get into that film. Festival. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes I struggle to come up with examples about, films well, that, that movie, that, that, that movie, but, that movie won yeah. the Oscar. So it's it okay. did. It did. Um, <laughs> And, you know, I'm sure there were film festivals that uh, that film did not get into. Of course. Uh, so, so, yeah, you know, don't take offense at your film not getting into film festivals. Don't think it means that you suck. Um, mm -hmm. That is sort of the number one trap that filmmakers fall into is either they get angry and offended because, you know, and assume the film festivals just don't know what they're doing or they didn't watch the film. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is that's utter garbage. Um or they think that they're doing something wrong. They might be, but it's not automatically that. Okay. Uh, so reasons to get rejected from film festivals. Uh, you know, too long, bad subject. Um, I think audio issues are always oh, yeah. uh, Technical, you know, a yeah. big one, right? Mm -hmm. um, a, a lot of people get will sense that something is wrong with a film without knowing what's wrong with it. They don't know why the film's annoying them. And that's very often because the audio is bad, right? It doesn't call itself out, but it's really easy to see with your eyes. Oh, this is out of focus or it's just bad quality or shot poorly. But when audio is bad, you don't necessarily recognize it. Um, and yeah, everything else is politics. Everything else is how does it serve our audience or our, or our sponsors? Well, and the, those things are connected directly. The, the sponsors, you know, sometimes want artistic control, but not that often. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Now, what would would you submit a work in progress? Talking about quality, I know a lot of filmmakers. I deal with a lot of filmmakers that want to like, oh, I want to submit them like work in progress or without color or or temp sound, or should you just wait? Submitting a work in progress is almost always an emotional decision. Mm -hmm. It is the little voice in the back of your head that says, if I don't hit this deadline, I'm missing out on something. The truth is nine times out of 10, you're not missing out on anything. If you don't make this deadline, there's another deadline coming up or there's another festival coming up or the same festival coming up next year. You know, th there's only a period of, you know, six to seven months between when, you know, a late deadline for a the festival closes and the early deadline for the next one opens up. That's not a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So you really um, don't let that little voice in the back of your head control what you do because it's going to cost you money and it's going to put you in competition with a lot of other films at a time when decisions have already been made, right? Like the mm -hmm. number of slots in the grocery cart that are available is less because you're coming into the process later, you know, later on. Mm -hmm. So works in progress, you know, that are usually submitted to meet a deadline and it's, it's kind of a pro move, right? Festival programmers can see beyond your, um, you know, 
your imperfect color or sound and then see the story there. Like they've seen enough works in progress. They know, can sort of tell what a film's going to look like. But if you are an unknown quantity, it's your first or second time doing the film festival thing. Um, and you don't really know what you're doing. You know, it puts your film at a disadvantage. Uh, why, why take that chance? Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No. And, and can, well, can we talk a little bit about Sundance? Because that is the mecca of all film festivals for a lot of independent filmmakers. And everyone kills themselves. I mean, every year when the, that deadline's coming, I get slammed with, we got to make the Sundance, man. I need you to make Blu-rays. I need to make this. I need to get this done. And it's like everyone kills themselves to try to get. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. That that deadline. Can you talk a little bit about the mystique, the the mythos that is Sundance, and how what the realities are of submitting to Sundance, and should they should everyone submit to Sundance as like that lottery ticket? Maybe we'll get in, or should they be more strategic on what works best for their film? I never discourage someone from submitting to Sundance mm-hmm. because if you don't submit to Sundance you have that little thing in the back of your head that says, Oh, but what if, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, some people can ignore that. Some people just go, you know what? I know I don't have a shot at Sundance and and that's okay. If you have that kind of confidence, then God bless, save yourself the 50 bucks and, or $90 or whatever it is at the late deadline and move on with your life. Uh, But if you know yourself well enough to know, Oh God, I would just always think, you know, what is, what what would have happened if I had submitted to that festival? Then by all means, submit. Uh, what are your chances realistically of actually getting into the Sundance Film Festival? Uh, every year I used to, and I haven't done this in a few years, but I used to calculate out, you know, given the number of screening slots and given the number of films that got submitted that year, what roughly was your chance of getting into the film festival? And it was always like, 0.03% or something. It was just some ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, there's 13. There's like, was it 13 competition films or something like that in Sundance? Well, that, that matters less than, the, you know, because you can't break it down like that. The, okay. The numbers you'd have to have access to would, would be crazy. And only got Sundance could, could do that. Got it. Got it. But if you break it down roughly to number of films or even number of shorts versus number of features, mm-hmm. you know, it doesn't take you very long before you get down to less than 1% chance of getting into that festival. Right. Compare that to um, other festivals where there are 200 slots and 5,000 films being submitted or even like 200 slots and a thousand films, you know, a thousand <laughs> films. Right. Your chances get a lot better. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's one of the reasons that I say avoid those Oscar qualifying festivals because – just the sheer math improves, right? <laughs> Think about <laughs> right. It. I am 10 times more likely to get into Festival A than Festival B simply because I know this one fact about how many submissions they get. That's crazy talk. You know, you should absolutely be thinking in those terms. A crazy good talk, rather. Um, so, yeah. Submit the Do sun. I think F- Sundance is worth it? Yes, please do submit. Submit the best copy version, whatever of your film that you possibly can send it into the ether and, you know, give it a kiss goodbye and then move on with your life. Maybe you'll hit the lottery. Maybe you won't. There are plenty of deserving and undeserving films that got into Sundance and had their lives changed. Don't rob yourself of that possibility. If you think there's even a chance you've got, you know, got that chance, but don't be surprised when you get the dear John letter. Well, I mean, a perfect example is that film I I was telling you about, Obsolidia, that was a late entry, no star, no connection submission, with which was color graded, but I think the sound was not done. So it was a work in progress. And they literally dropped it off the last day, physically dropped it off in the Sundance office here in L.A. And they were one of the 13 in competition and won two awards. So it happens. But it was but that movie fit a very specific hole in that shopping cart that was perfect for it was just like that a year earlier that movie doesn't get in a year later that movie doesn't get in but that year it just happened to make it in so yeah that, that's the kind of lightning in a bottle thing that yeah that that does happen and what what makes sundance so awesome mm-hmm. um that speaks to the quality of their programming that they you know a lot of festivals wouldn't given those kinds of numbers wouldn't have been able to catch that film 
mm-hmm. that late in, in the, you know, in the submissions process, a couple of screeners would have watched it. They would have given it high marks and, you know, somewhere in between the, that rush of whatever, you know, the programming team might or might not have been able to look at those scores and, and give it that chance. Some of the things that you mentioned in that story, mm-hmm. though, you know, the fact that there were no stars, the fact that there were no connections, to, mm-hmm. you know, that calls to, you know, to, to the, to the attention, the idea that you have to have main actors in your film to get into Sundance or that you have to have, know someone on the inside. Mm-hmm. You don't. Mm-mm. Sundance has a very vested interest in discovering new talent. They need to be seen as the ones who plucked that filmmaker from obscurity because they made great art and, you know, made something out of them by the very power of the prestige that is Sundance. They have that reputation to maintain. So they are on the lookout for you. I promise, you know, if you've got what it takes, they will find you. I mean, how many, how many careers have they launched? I mean, Precisely. I mean, just just every I minute. Mean, the list is insane. Now, can right. you, when I when I hear filmmakers say, "Oh, they didn't even watch my film," and you know, and I realize this makes me seem like an incredible snob and, mm-hmm. and very derisive, but I hear this a lot, you mm-hmm. know, and it, it, it does you no credit to say I can't get into Sundance because I don't know anyone there and I don't have any name actors in my no. film. That's, that that is that's you know sh- selling yourself short. And selling them short. Okay. Now, and, end of rant. Okay. But with that said, though, having star power, maybe not for Sundance, but for a lot of other festivals, does help in the submission process because at the end of the day, they want asses in seats. And uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Do you agree with that statement? Of course I agree with that statement. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you could have Brad Pitt on your uh, of course. podcast instead of me, <laughs> you would, right? Absolutely not, Chris. I am loyal to the bone, <laughs> sir. Uh the simple fact is – Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Mr. Pitt's calling me now. I got to go. Yeah. <laughs> and the horse you rode in on. Mr. Uh, yes, stars put butts in seats. But there are you know, some percentage of slots at any given festival that are dedicated to those things. Mm-hmm. Those are the opening night and closing night and centerpiece films. And they serve a very specific purpose. But you're not competing with those films. Mm-hmm. Those films generally don't get submitted to festivals. Those films, so particularly the ones with A-list actors. I mean, if you've got like a B or a C named yeah, celebrity it's... who's been on TV a few times, mm-hmm. okay, yeah, some of those. But those aren't what I would call serious competition for for your your film if your film has a better story. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, th- those films are are curated from either other festivals or from the distributors who own their rights. They come through a completely different channel than the open calls for for entry and so don't resent those films Mm -hmm. be glad those films are there because they're paying for the slot that you're occupying because you know depending on how things go a lot of the smaller indie films don't draw as big of an audience and you've got a half empty theater and you know that uh screening costs just as much to put on as the the one that was 100% full. Mm-hmm. So in, in a lot of ways, they're paying the rent for, you know, your opportunity. That's a great way of looking at it. Um, and can you talk a little bit about first tier and second tier film festivals? I know a lot of people have heard those terms. What Can you explain it a little bit? So you can look at tiers one of two ways. Either you can look at tiers objectively, like Sundance is a first tier film festival. No, no bones about it, right? Um, or you can look at them, um, from a perspective of at what tier is this festival relative to my film? If you have a science fiction film, right. Then a festival like fantastic fest or Fantasia or, or, um, something like that, that's going to be a first tier fest for you, right? That's going to bring you the audience and the prestige and, you know, everything that you want from a festival. So that's like your first tier targets, those might not be first tier festivals on the objective scale. Nobody's going to say that fantastic fest is as prestigious as Sundance in any other context. But you know, so those, that when I talk about tiers, that's sort of what I, what I mean by those two things. Right. Um, what makes a tier one fest versus a tier two fest? It's a combination of factors from audience size, number of films they're able to program number, um, you know, how much money they have, whether they're Oscar accredited or not. Um, 
who their backers are, right? It's Robert Redford and Robert De Niro bring a lot of cachet to the festivals that that they um, underwrite. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of different factors there. Um, it's it's not like there's any industry standard. There's nobody setting down the canonical, these festivals are tier one or tier two, and this is, you know, how it shall be forevermore. Uh, but those distinctions do exist. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Um, yeah, exactly. Like if you have a horror movie and Scream Fest is going to be on the top of that list or a horror, you know, one of the top horror film festivals are going to be much higher than, let's say, Sundance. Yeah, possibly. I mean, Sundance has its own. Midnight's thing, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're going to absorb as many genres as they can because they they want you know, the prestige of having found those things too. Um, mm-hmm. Again, go ahead and submit your film to Sundance. It's okay. But <laughs> know that, that Scream Fest or Shriek Fest or whoever it is will, will also be there for you. So these, uh, these last few questions are the ones I ask of all of my, all of my guests, sir. So prepare yourself. These are the toughest of all the questions. Well, having never listened to your podcast before, I am taken totally unawares. <laughs> touche, sir. Touche. Um, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? So the lesson that I keep learning every day and uh, sort of took the longest to crystallize in my mind was that, you know, while I would not call film festivals an industry, it is a business. Um, and, and there's an economy to everything. What you are doing when you put your film into the into the world, into the film festival world, is you are hoping to attract a customer. You're hoping to make a sale. There's a transaction happening. And you have something of value to offer in that transaction. And that thing is your film, right? You, uh, by way of your film, are delivering, hoping uh, to help the festival attract an audience. And that's what the festival wants from you. The festival has an array of things that are of value to you, uh, primarily um, a slot in the festival itself, but lots of other stuff that goes along with that. So depending on how high the value of your film is, you can use that leverage to you know, barter or bargain for other things that the festival has of value to, to give you, such as a better time slot or help with your travel, or in some extreme cases, even a screening fee. Um, and again, that all depends on how high the value of your film is to what you what you can negotiate for. But never forget that it is an economy and you have the power to negotiate if you are aware that negotiating is an option. Good to know. Very good to know. Now, what are your top three favorite films of all time? Let's see. Um in no particular order, uh, because they all hold the same place in my heart. Uh, the apartment, uh, okay. with Jack Lemon, Shirley MacLaine, uh, mm-hmm. singing in the rain. Okay. And Joe versus the volcano. Oh, I freaking love Joe versus the volcano, man. That was such an underrated. And I was, uh, my next question was one of the most underrated films of all that you've ever seen. I it think would be Joe versus the volcano. Yeah. No question about it. If, 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 if everybody out there listening, go find, Joe versus the volcano starts Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. And it was a brilliant misunderstood movie when it was released. I remember seeing it in the theater. Nobody got it only years later that it start becoming a cult, uh, a cult movie that people just love. Just hit iTunes like a year or two ago. It was not on iTunes for the longest time. So Uh um, it is now part of my iTunes library. If I were going to answer that question with a film that's not in my top three, I would uh-huh. say Steve Martin's L.A. Story. Oh, I love L.A. Story. I remember that's another one. That was another one that people just did not get. Only people in L.A. got that movie. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's brilliant and has a lot of people in it who were not much of any. Like so many emerging stars. Came Sarah, Michelle, Sarah Michelle, uh, not Sarah Michelle, uh, Sarah Jessica Parker. Yep. It was one of them I remember off the top of my head. I haven't seen a that lot movie. Of, a lot of character actors, yeah. Definitely worth a look. Um, so where can people find you? And I heard you had a little something special for the uh, the Indie Film Hustle tribe. I do. Uh, if the tribe will direct their web browsers to filmfestivalsecrets.com slash hustle. Mm-hmm. And hopefully everybody who's listening to this knows how to spell hustle. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, 
you will find a, a downloadable list of my top festivals for hustlers. Uh, you heard me say earlier that you know the Oscar accredited festivals are maybe not your best targets. Um, this is a list of festivals that are maybe lesser known, but uh, still incredibly excellent. Um, and I've got some for shorts, I've got some for features, and I even have some for some of the genres out there like uh, LGBTQ and sci-fi and stuff like that. Awesome, awesome. And so, and then where can people find you other than that? Well, there's filmfestivalsecrets.com, obviously. Um, there is a podcast on which a certain Mr. Ferrari might have been a guest recently. <laughs> uh, so if you search for the Film Festival Secrets podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcatcher, you can find me there. I'm on Twitter at Film Fest Secrets, and you can find me at film festivals. Uh, you know, sometimes I speak uh, in in person live uh, at film festivals, so you can find me there. And if I'm not mistaken, you were just named one of the top five filmmaking podcasts by Movie Maker Magazine. Am I correct? Yep, I am an essential podcast, says Movie Maker. So, um, and I'm not yeah. and I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter for not making the list. I'm just saying I'm not bitter at all. That's OK. I wouldn't be bitter <laughs> if I were you. Either. <laughs> and you also wrote a book. I did write a book. Uh, second edition of Film Festival Secrets. You see a theme emerging here. Yes, I see. Film Festival Secrets, a handbook for independent filmmakers. If you go to filmfestivalsecrets.com slash resources, you can order these uh, pre-order the second edition, which will be out in mid-April, I believe. Um, and uh, you can get the first edition for free when you do the pre-order. Chris, thank you so much for taking out the time to talk to the tribe. I really appreciate all the the knowledge bombs you dropped on us today for film festivals. So thanks again for taking out the time, man. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And film festivals can be a field of landmines if you're not careful. There is a lot of things that you need to kind of know before you go into it. And, and a lot of times you just have to learn that the hard way. But by using uh, by going by visiting Chris at his website at filmfestivalsecrets.com uh, or getting our course, Film Festival Hacks, uh, that really helps you out a lot and kind of I mean, a little bit of investment right up front will save you thousands of dollars later. I wish I would have had that course before I started my my uh, film festival runs with all my my projects and believe me like i said before i lost a ton of cash doing that so and also what I, me and chris kind of put together is we've put together a free podcast series all about film festivals we're going to do an eight episode run um and if it really does well we might do another uh, another season but for the first season we're going to do eight episodes and it will be called the Film Festival Hacks Podcast. And we will put a link in the show notes when it launches. It won't launch probably for about at least another week or two. Um, but when it launches, you can come back here and check it out at um, IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 067 is the show notes. And you can find the link there. Now, as promised, I am going to be giving you guys a link for 50% off our course, the Film Festival Hacks. Uh, it's an online course you can take online. You can put it on your iPhone, watch it anytime you like. The link is IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Festival Hacks 50. That's IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Festival Hacks 50. Now, this will be for a limited time only. We may only have it up for a couple weeks, so I would jump on it as fast as possible because after that, it goes back up to the normal price of 50 bucks but it will be 25 bucks, which is an insane deal for this kind of course. So check it out. I wanted to let you guys know that we have a Indie Film Hustle community on Facebook. It's a private uh, private group that I've put together, and we have over 4,200 now members uh, in it, and you can head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Facebook and sign up. We do a lot of uh, talking there. We help each other out. We show each other's work. And we just kind of start, you know, communicating and helping each other out there. So that's what the community and the group is all about. So it's at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Facebook. Thanks again for listening, guys. I hope you got a lot out of this episode. And keep the hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I will talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.
So you're still here. Well, to all my loyal listeners who have stuck around for a little bit longer, I've got a little surprise for you. Uh, Chris Holland has just opened up quietly the Film Festival Secrets Vault, and that will allow you to get into his vault and into his archives of... We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Just tons and hours and hours of uh, video content as well as articles and uh, consulting action, all sorts of different things that you can do. Uh, And it's a monthly membership and it's uh, 15 bucks a month or you can buy a six month package or a year long package and save like 60% off the monthly fee. So it's definitely worth it. If you're a filmmaker and you're submitting films to film festivals, definitely check it out. Uh, And to get in, all you have to do is go to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash FF secrets. That's IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash FF secrets. And I got a bunch of cool stuff coming up, a couple of announcements coming up in the coming months. I'm working really, really hard on a bunch of stuff for you guys. So stay tuned and thank you for being Loyal Indie Film Hustlers. I appreciate it, guys. Hope all is well. All the best with all of your projects. Keep that hustle going, man, all right? And keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. 